This will be part one of a two-part presentation in which I'll talk about construction of a system dynamics model to help with the treatment of dialysis patients. This uh, is a copy of a presentation made at the 29th International Conference of the System Dynamics Society in July of uh, 2011 in Washington, D.C. Here is a link to uh, the System Dynamics Society and you'll be able to uh, find a copy of an accompanying paper at, uh, for under the uh, appropriate navigation of that website. There are a number of audiences I have in mind, important audiences, patients, practitioners and providers, regulators, researchers of biomedical, and uh, I'll refer to in and out system dynamics practitioners. There are three messages that I would like to communicate. Uh, when it comes to dialysis patients, the management of anemia is a critical issue for the vast majority of them. And uh, we found that we were able to use system dynamics modeling to redefine the problem and then solve that redefi redefined problem to lead to some really uh, stellar results. System dynamics modeling could very well provide the tools for learning in the uh, important area of individualized or personalized medicine. The team that was involved, I won't go through the individual roles of each person on the team, but I will say that uh, each of us were doing things that we love personally and care about deeply, and if any one person had been missing from the team, the project would not have worked the way that it did. Uh, we also had the benefit of the insights from uh, nephrologists, hematologists, and the long-lasting and uh, generous support of uh, Steve Gudgel, the administrator, who made sure that this project uh, was conceived of and uh, completed and brought to uh, fruition. Some terminology. Chronic kidney disease is referring to a permanent loss of kidney function. Uh, the kidneys don't get better. Uh, End-stage renal disease refers to that point in time where the kidney has lost the majority of its function, its inability to function normally. Some critical function will functions we'll describe a little bit later on. Hemodialysis is one of several treatment options for chronic kidney disease that has advanced to the stage of end-stage renal disease. 90% of the patients require what are called erythropoietic stimulating agents. I'll be referring to them as ESAs to prevent and control the anemia of CKD. I'll define those a little bit better in just a couple minutes. This is a big deal. In uh, 2010, there were 380,000 uh, patients receiving hemodialysis in the United States, um, and the incidence of end-stage renal disease, of which the majority will move to hemodialysis, was 120,000 per year. So for 2011, now with 406,000 patients, just think about the scratch, think about the implications of that. A little scratch pad here. The time budgets of hemodialysis patients, if you look at three sessions per week for four hours per week, traveling an hour to and an hour from, okay, that amounts to more than 60,000 person years of effort just to receive the basic treatment. At the estimated reimbursement rate of $30,000, which is a reduction from previous levels, this still costs uh, over $12 billion a year. Some more terminology, hemoglobin is a protein that enables the transport of oxygen to the body and carbon dioxide from the body to the lungs. The term erythropoiesis comes from the Greek, it means red making, so we're talking about the production of red blood cells. Erythropoietic stimulating agents are a class of drugs designed to replace the naturally occurring hormone erythropoietin. And apoptosis is a term we'll use, it comes from the Greek meaning falling leaves. And this refers to programmed cell death, and we'll see where that comes in in the red blood cell cycle in just a minute or two. Anemia is a big deal among dialysis patients. Um, I'm not going to read these bullets to you. I'll let's let you glance them over. And I want you to imagine a 68-year-old man climbing into the car in his Wednesday morning treatment, the second of the week on some cold November morning not feeling well, didn't sleep well, can't concentrate, doesn't remember if he took his proper medications or not. Yesterday afternoon he had to pause halfway up the stairs because he thought he was going to pass out. And he's now going to turn the key to go get hooked up to a dialysis machine for four hours of uh, treatment and then uh, repeat it again on Friday. 
Um, this is a really lousy way to have to live and to do that. And if anemia can be controlled, it represents a huge improvement in the quality of life for these patients. Now, ESA and iron replacement therapies can effectively treat anemia. However, the current protocols do not address what system dynamicists call system as cause issues. What that means is the protocol itself plays a role in generating the poor management of anemia. We'll talk about that as well. I'm going to be showing you a number of charts that are structured this way. On the left-hand vertical axis is the ESA dose, and the right-hand uh, axis is the hemoglobin response. Actual historical ESA doses are shown in green, and the hemoglobins are shown in red. Okay, the two black lines are hemoglobin values ranging from 10 to 13, which was the target range for hemoglobin. As we look at this patient, we notice a couple of things. Over a 661-day period, we see a number of excursions above and below the target range. We see clusters of hemoglobin measurements taken together very closely in time, meaning that the patient was most likely hospitalized one, two, three, four, five, six times, a little bit less than two years, 22-month period. Um, we also see large increases in hemoglobin values here, and we see another one here, and most likely the patient was being transfused at that time. The message in the chart, this patient is not doing well during this uh, almost two-year period. Patient two, same structure of the chart, we see hemoglobin values again, following the cyclic oscillation, and we see the, as we did on a previous chart, the kind of wild variations in ESA dosing that's going on. So, in general, and idealized, what we saw and observed was a hemoglobin cycling in these patients, where the, uh, the period was about six to nine months. When the hemoglobin is too high, there's cardiovascular damage, there's a risk of clotting and thrombosis, there's an increased risk of stroke. When the hemoglobin is too low, the patient is feeling anemic. Now, here's the thing. Typically, providers would measure their hemoglobin one time per month and may look at the previous month, but probably not look back, uh, especially on what's called a behavior over time chart at the uh, pattern of this. And so this cyclic variation was just uh, unobservable, it, it, just undetected for a lot of the providers there. Okay, the goal of the model we wanted to put in place being system dynamics, folks, is we realized there was a structure that generated this oscillation that had to do with red blood cell production, and we could find it, and we could dampen that oscillation and find the ESA dosing levels that would stabilize the patient's hemoglobin in the, the target range. That was the goal of the project. Let's talk a little bit about how uh, erythropoiesis works in a healthy individual. Let's suppose there's a change in the oxygen, uh, uh, there's an oxygen deficit in the, in the carrying capacity of the blood. That tells the kidneys to increase erythropoietin, which finds its way to the marrow, which are the factories of red blood cells. And the impact of that hormone is to decrease the apoptosis that we mentioned. That allows more red blood cells to survive, increasing the carrying capacity of the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, restoring it back to normal levels. In system dynamics, that's called a balancing feedback loop, where the change in one variable, the blood oxygen level, leads to a change through intervening variables to itself back to the level it came from. The problem is with uh, kidney disease patients, the kidneys do not produce the uh, erythropoietin, and what that does is destroys the balancing loop. So for treatment, what we do is we provide an uh, external ESA, identical in structure and action to the normally, the naturally produced erythropoietin, and that uh, allows us to restore the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Note that in the first case the body is measuring the oxygen carrying capacity. What we're measuring in this case is the, the provider is measuring the hemoglobin level as a surrogate or an indicator of the oxygen level. Final point to make here in this exogenous uh, balancing loop is that this is a 15 to 20, whether it comes from the natural hormone 
or it comes from the external hormone. This is a 15 to 20 day balancing loop. Okay. That, and to a system dynamics person, that says this system is an oscillation waiting to happen. This is a conceptual view of the uh, model that we came up with. Here we have two compartments. On the left hand side we have the bone marrow and on the right hand side we have the circulation. And we've captured in the model that portion of the erythropoietic process in which the impact of ESAs make a difference. In other words, in earlier stages before what are called the blast forming units, uh, red blood cells uh, in their first uh, 15 to 18 days of development are not sensitive to uh, or responsive to ESAs. Starting with the colony forming unit and pretty much at only the colony forming unit, um, the, this cell type is absolutely dependent upon the ESA level for uh, survival. The, there is an apoptosis, programmed cell death, that happens unless an appropriate level of ESA is made available. When an appropriate level of ESA is made available, that allows more cells to survive, which leads to the creation of more reticulocytes, which leads to mat uh, maturing reticulocytes into circulation and ultimately red blood cells. Okay, that was the idea of the model. And what we're able to do is, I'm highlighting here the patient-specific parameters of the model. We're able to use the model to take the historical values of ESA doses and the corresponding time-delayed RB or hemoglobin measures, pardon me, the time-delayed hemoglobin measures, to come up with patient-specific parameters that would allow us, all other things being equal, to determine what level of ESA dose will ultimately create a stable red blood cell level for the patient. Now I mentioned the phrase all things being equal, all things are never equal and so in addition to having the hemoglobin level which this structure I've outlined here uh, calculates, the practitioner, Craig, would need to look at what are the iron levels, what are the various vitamin levels like B12 and folate, uh, what are the fluid situations? Has there been a transfusion lately? Is there any bleeding? Did the patient come? And so on. Many, many factors to think about. But this model was intended to be and turned out to be a huge step forward in uh, coming up with what dosing level will create uh, the right RBC level. In the development of the model, we tested it by simulating how the current protocol works. Now we don't have time to go into the details of how the per current protocol works, but essentially it is uh, when the hemoglobin is high, give them a low dose. When the hemoglobin is low, give them a higher dose. When the hemoglobin is in the target range, maintain the dose. That's kind of the thinking. So what we did to test the model is we said, well let's suppose a patient starts with a hemoglobin level of a little over 13. And we look at the protocol and it says, give them a low dose. It looks like about 40 units here. Okay, now we simulate for another two-week period, let's say. The hemoglobin level has dropped a little bit. And essentially, the protocol says, stay at about the same level. And so we give them that dose. Now I've, I've gone through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more steps where stepwise we're going through determining what level of... ESA should uh, or does the current protocol um, uh, prescribe and we follow this pattern out and we see pattern one oscillation where the the current protocol actually generates dosing regimens that create the very oscillation we're trying to get rid of. There was another pattern following the same sort of simulation stepwise um, where the patient's hemoglobin level would stabilize at a given level, uh, but that level was uncontrolled and uh, maybe below the uh, target range, within the target range, or above the target range. So the current protocol did not provide the kind of control that we needed. All right, what we've talked about is anemia, we've talked about the terminology, we've talked about the balancing loop and feedback and all of that in part one of the session, and we've described a, uh, a little bit about the model and how it worked. I'd like to conclude uh, part one right now, 
and then in part two when we resume we'll pick up and see what were the results of actually putting the model into practice.